Thank you so much for everyone that is on here. Good evening. This is our first uh, virtual workshop for Wonder Girls. Um, it is all about empowering our future female leaders. And here tonight with us is Magna Gopal, which I'll go into a little bit before she leads. Um, Wonder Girls is about confidence, leadership, community, and business. Those are our four pillars of the organization. And I'll go in a little bit more about that. But my name is Natalie Maniscalco and I am the co-founder of Wonder Girls, along with my dear friend, colleague, and partner in crime, Irene Zerbudis, who you'll hear from a little bit later. She is the super mom of three amazing teenage daughters. So she is in the trenches when it comes to teenage life and is an amazing asset to this organization. So what is Wonder Girls? We are a nonprofit organization and an after school program that is held at high schools throughout New York, throughout the suburbs of New York and um, New Jersey, specifically in the areas of Bergen County and Rockland County. That is right now. And the th three core pillars of our, of our uh, after school program is about building confidence, leadership and business skills. The program is broken up into 12 different workshops that uh, the first part is all about building confidence, self-esteem, leadership skills, team building, problem solving, public speaking. And then the second part of the program is really fine tuning their business skills and focusing on learning about personal finances, career opportunities based on your passion and your interests all of the educational paths that they may choose, whether they decide to go to a college or a trade school, how to search and apply for jobs and schools, uh, resume building, professional writing, as I joke around, learning not how, how to not use emojis in an email and LOLs. Um, we also talk about social media and the effects of social media and how to use it for the social good, as well as photo manipulation. Uh, we go into interviews and how to interview and how to dress for interviews. And then we, we uh, end with a, a workshop on sexual harassment so that they're prepared with the necessary tools and resources that they need in order to succeed. Another key component of our program is uh, the volunteer days. And this is where the girls get the opportunity to gain hands-on experience with nonprofit organizations throughout the, both counties. We've already start the, started this type of uh, programming and we've worked with different organizations, including People to People, Women's Rights Center. Uh, we're also working with Women's Center for Safety and Change, Keep Rockland Beautiful. And next month, uh, or actually for May, we'll be uh, working with Meals on Wheels. And the girls here are really being taught about social responsibility at a very young age, the understanding and the meaning behind giving back to those in need. And this also helps to build their confidence and sense of well being by helping others. Um, and then, most importantly, as a core component of our program, they also learn about nonprofit uh, careers and where they can, if they're interested in marketing, communications, or event planning, they can actually do that within the nonprofit world. At the end of the program, all of our seniors are eligible to apply for the Wonder Girls Scholarship they must be enrolled in the Wonder Girls program at their high school. And it is a wonderful opportunity to gain um, financial support for college. And the, un the lower grades are also eligible for different prizes and awards for their work with the work that they do with Wonder Girls. So this is our why. Everyone asks, why did you and Irene start a nonprofit organization in the middle of a pandemic, right? Keyword, nonprofit, right? But we know that with the effects of social media and the pandemic, more than ever, girls need the support and guidance, even more so than boys. And studies show that seven in 10 girls believe they are not good enough or do not measure up in some way when it comes to their appearance, their body image, their home or family life, their school, 
their friends and social life. And that is all interrelated when it comes to their overall performance, when it comes to their level of confidence and their self-esteem and what they wanna do with themselves in their lives. And this is why this program is so important. And this is why Wonder Girls is aiming to change this. So this is my favorite page. This is the testimonials that we have gathered from our girls who have been a part of our volunteer days. And before and after every volunteer day, we take a survey to see how the girls are feeling before they come in and then how they feel afterwards. And this is the page that warms my heart because it really is just so amazing to see that these girls are completely embracing everything that we are trying to convey and teach them and to make them feel like they're amazing and powerful and confident. And it's all about helping each other and not putting each other down, but being there for each other for the support that they need. So you could just take a little time to read some of these. We have over 20 of them, um, which are up on our website if you'd like to read more. So how can you get involved? We have a million and one things going on, but these are some of our core things that are important for you to know about that I wanted to just mention. We have our volunteer days, uh, which uh, occur every month. Our next one is next Thursday on May 13th. As I mentioned, we'll be working with Meals on Wheels. And I also would like, like to mention that our volunteer days are open to all high school girls and even lower grades as well as uh, college grade so that the girls are networking and they're meeting girls from all over the different counties. They, they don't have to be enrolled in the Wonder Girls program for the high school. They could still partake, especially if girls are looking for community service, if they need it for their high school. We are also launching a 5K virtual walk run, which is our Wonder Girls wellness campaign for June, starting on June 1st through June, through June 27th. And we'll finish that campaign up with our Wonder Girls Wellness Day, which is on Sunday, June 27th, starting at 10 a.m. And it's a fun-filled fitness day that is open to the public as well. And this is all to raise funds for educational programming for Wonder Girls and for uh, scholarships. And we also will be doing uh, a June virtual workshop like we're doing tonight and another volunteer day. So if you log on to our website, you can find out more information and uh, we will also be doing that through July and August. So if you're looking for activities uh, for your girls, we'll be providing some programming during the summer as well. So without further ado, I would love to introduce Magna Gopal. She is a coach, a TEDx speaker, and an internationally renowned dancer. Magna and I met over 10 years ago, and we have just stayed friends, remained friends, and I have always respected her. She is the perfect example of someone who follows her passion in order to make a life and a business and every time I see her she has this beautiful big smile and she's just so amazing and she's traveled over to through all of the world over 80 countries I believe and she's just such an amazing person so I'm so excited to introduce her tonight and I'm gonna let her lead the way. Got it. <laughs> there you go. So the the catchphrase of the year, right? Going into 2021, you're on mute, always. <laughs> uh, first of all, I would like to say a huge thank you to Irene and Natalie and to Wonder Girls for this amazing opportunity to get a chance to speak to all of you um, and to share the lessons that I've gained. And not only that, but even just to present this workshop, like to come up with this workshop today. Um, there are so many things that I have had to reflect upon in my own life that I didn't even realize had such an impact on me. So um, I would like to start by saying that I feel very fortunate to have found my passion for dancing early on in life and to have been able to nurture that passion into a career that has allowed me to travel to through the world. And as Natalie said, 
to 80 countries so far to teach thousands of people, give a TED talk and pursue so many other opportunities. And for today's workshop, I'm gonna share a few lessons that I learned along the way that have helped me to run a successful business, build meaningful relationships and become a respected leader and innovator in my industry. I think, uh, or at least I hope that these lessons will help empower our young women to confidently pursue their dreams and enable our parents and educators, especially those of you who are here, to better support them in those pursuits. Now, these lessons weren't handed down by friends or family or even teachers, but from life itself. They came from living life, making mistakes, and making difficult decisions that forced me to look inward, confront my fears, evaluate my decisions, my desires, discover my worth, identify my strengths and weaknesses, and ultimately find and express my authentic voice. Now, as we go through these lessons today, I would appreciate if everyone could take a small moment to reflect and see how and if you apply that lesson to your own life. And if you don't, where you could start. With each lesson, I'll end with a question that you can, if you want, take notes or you can add your answer into the chat and then we can get into a little discussion of that when we go into our Q&A. Lesson numero uno, better alone than in bad company. Now I learned this one in high school. When I started, I wasn't in the best company. My friends and I, though we were very popular, we're never up to anything good. Like we would often skip class, hang out, drink, smoke cigarettes, smoke weed. I blame the cigarettes on my growth, my stunted growth, and basically waste our days. And then one day, I'm not sure what exactly triggered the question, but I asked those friends what their plans were after high school. And for those who hadn't gotten pregnant and dropped out of high school, their plans weren't very ambitious, unfortunately. And when I spoke to them about myself wanting to go to university, they laughed. And it was then that I realized that we did not have the same goals and I would not achieve mine staying on that path with those friends. To this day, I'm not even sure where I got the strength and the courage to make what seemed like a self-sabotaging decision for a teenager, but I cut them all off. I went from most popular one year to loner the next, voluntarily. But in that time, I learned the importance of surrounding myself with people I aligned with. And more importantly, if I couldn't find those people, I realized that I was comfortable and strong enough to carve my own path alone. So my question to all of you will be, how comfortable are you with being alone? Share your answers in chat or take a note. Lesson number two, believe in yourself and be willing to take risks. Choosing to pursue salsa as a career wasn't my childhood dream. And as such, it wasn't actually an easy choice when it presented itself. I had just completed my undergrad degree had tens of thousand dollars in loans for school that were coming due and had bills and rent to pay. Fortunately, I also got a job in a very good company with great potential for growth. But then on the other hand, there was salsa dancing, presenting me with an opportunity to travel the world, perform and teach dance. Like in one way, it seemed like a dream come true. And at the same time, the dumbest idea possible. And almost everyone at the time thought, Magna, keep your stable job and keep salsa as a side hobby. And when I did the exact opposite, they cringe. I, I took a big risk, but this reward of where I am today, even in front of all of you, and all that I have learned and accomplished has been more than worth it. And hand in hand with taking these risks is believing in ourselves, believing that we are not only capable of meeting that challenge, of that pursuit that we are taking, but also believing in our ability to bounce back if it doesn't work out. So my question to all of you here is, what are you passionate about? And what are you willing to risk to pursue your passion? Lesson number three, you can't please everyone. 
I had to revisit this just this week. <laughs> now, this one is especially true if you are a creative, if you're innovative, but it really doesn't matter what you do. There will always be critics. For example, let's say you make a sandwich. Someone will say, too much mayo. Another, not enough mayo. And yet another, that you shouldn't eat dairy. The toast is perfectly crispy, too. You burnt it. Someone will ask, why are you trying a new recipe when the old one was good enough? And someone else will insist that this was the best recipe ever and you should never go back. And my experience with dance has been no different. As a beginner, everyone wanted to tell me the right way to do things. Uh, and they weren't shy about expressing their disappointment when I did something else. When I started getting creative with my expression, everyone chimed in with whether or not they liked it. And let it be noted, I never asked. And when I created shows, I had people complaining or rather comparing me to my past work, saying the new stuff isn't working for me and I should keep doing what I did before. Or the complete opposite, that everything I did before was good and this is the style I should be dancing instead. But like a sandwich, there are many ways to approach this dance. And given that I didn't take the road less traveled, I took the road not traveled. I encountered even more resistance, criticism, unsolicited feedback, and just plain negativity. So I had to learn very quickly how to focus on myself and mute all of those voices. Besides, my career today is the direct result of pursuing my vision despite the critics. Now, and as Eleanor uh, Roosevelt said, damned if you do, damned if you don't. So you might as well do what feels right to you because you will be criticized either way. And so my, questioning to, my question to all of you with this lesson is, how often do you stifle your own expression to try to please others? Lesson number four, learn how to say no gently but firmly. This is what I gave my TED talk on, the benefits of rejection. But this lesson can actually be connected to all of the others I mentioned today. It's all about establishing and respecting your boundaries. When I started dancing for fun, all I wanted to do was dance. I was asking everyone, right, left and center, trying to dance every single song every time I was out. And when I got really good and started traveling to events for work, I didn't have to ask much. I was the guest, the featured international artist, and there was always a cue for the artists, especially the ones with a reputation for being great social dancers and a reputation for never saying no. Now this worked perfectly until I got injured. I had a few injuries through my career, but there was a period of three years when they just kept compounding and getting worse. And the reason was because I didn't wanna offend or hurt anyone's feelings by saying no. Besides, it wasn't like I couldn't dance. It was just extremely painful, even with painkillers. Unfortunately, I would say it took me about three long years to learn that if I didn't respect my body, my time, my energy, and my wants, no one else would be inclined to do so either. And to be honest, saying no didn't actually make things worse. In fact, it allowed me and my partners to enjoy the yeses that much more. So my question to you here is, can you think of any areas or instances in your life where you could benefit from establishing some boundaries? Lesson number five, Cinco. I would say Cinco de Mayo, but that was yesterday. Don't be afraid to walk away. Now this one, kind of hits home. This one also ties into the previous story about my three consecutive years being injured. Not only did I not say no on the dance floor, but I also didn't say no to events or did I cancel them, even when the doctors insisted that I take time to rest. And the reason I didn't say no wasn't because I was, would offend the event organizer, but because I was scared. I had been dancing for 10 years at that point more than half of my adult life was attached to this dance and invested in this career. And honestly, I didn't know who I was without it. 
And when I told my friends that I might need to cancel events, they would warn me, Magna, mm, be careful. If you cancel events, you probably won't get booked again. So I was scared, not only of losing my career, but what that meant in terms of losing myself. And it wasn't until I was willing to lose it, to walk away from it, that I was finally able to recover. I had to decide that if this career and this community did not value my health and my well being and afford me the time that I needed to take care of myself, then I didn't need or want to be a part of it, even if it was the love of my life. And I think this applies not just to careers and jobs, but with any type of relationship that we have. And I canceled almost three months of back to back gigs, uncertain of the dance future. Fortunately, I made a full recovery and I was back to work. And when I returned with that mindset, I felt more empowered and free, free to stay, free to walk away, knowing that losing a title or a status doesn't strip me of the knowledge and the skills that I had acquired to get that title. So I am intelligent. I felt like I was intelligent and capable enough to successfully apply myself to anything I choose. And so my question to all of you here would be, is there anything you are scared to lose? And how might it be holding you back from what you want to achieve? Lesson number six, be humble, be kind, and be consistent. One other thing you often see in many careers and even social circles is a change in personalities that tends to accompany a change in status. In my industry, as most dancers increased in skill and popularity, so did they in ego and attitude. To be honest, I fell victim to that for a short period as well, acting superior to others and creating distance from those that were not at my level. But it didn't last for long. It's not my nature. I'm, if you get to know me, I'm very much of a people person. But over those couple of months, I realized how quickly and easily I could dismantle everything that I was trying to build in terms of my business, my brand, my friendships, and my relationships with my students and my community. It was only the return to being kind, humble, and consistent that helped me repair that damage that I had done. And I realized that popularity or achieving a higher status is not about how many people worship and look up to you, but about how many people you get the opportunity to serve, how many people you can support in their journey, and how many people you feel responsible to lead. So think about how you treat others. Do you treat them differently based on status? And are you aware of the indirect impact it has on you? And finally, lesson seven, honor your commitments. Talent and artistry and even good looks rank high in the dance industry, rank high in any entertainment industry that has a powerful or public face. And there are some dancers with zero experience, but a lot of talent who get scouted and then quickly pushed to fame. Great opportunity. But sometimes those same artists think that their talent excuses anything bad that they do. I personally know some incredibly talented individuals who have strolled in unprepared for workshops, showed up hungover, didn't show up for rehearsals, we're still in their rooms getting ready while everyone was waiting backstage to start the shows. Artists who missed their flights and meh, shrugged it off or canceled last minute for some better opportunity. Talent, even good looks might get you through the door, but your work ethic is what's gonna keep you there and open more doors for you. So if you wanna build solid personal and professional relationships, be responsible, be reliable, and be trustworthy. Say what you're gonna do, or don't say you're gonna do it. And if you say you're gonna do it, commit 100% and give it your best. And if you don't fulfill your commitment or make a mistake, it's okay, but don't pass the buck. Take responsibility instead. A little exercise and reflection with this lesson. How often would you say you are on time for your appointments? 
And I have a feeling most people are like, oh, my doctor's appointment, I was there right on time. My interviews, I was there right on time. But not just doctor's appointments and interviews, but every appointment or meeting you agree to. The time you tell yourself you'll go to the gym, the time you arrive for work, your Sunday brunch with your friends, the time you said you call someone back. You might be surprised at how often you don't honor commitments, even to yourself. If so, perfect place to start. Now, each and every one of these lessons in today's workshops can be applied to our lives, regardless of our age or occupation. But the next few lessons that I'm gonna to go to are geared more to our parents and our educators. And I'm speaking as a teacher and a coach and as a child who didn't grow up in a supportive and nurturing environment of family and friends. And these are a few things I missed out on that I am sure I would have benefited from if they were present in my life. Lesson one, create a safe space. When it came to my passions, I didn't feel comfortable discussing it with my parents. If it wasn't academic or traditional, they didn't care. They didn't wanna know more. They were dismissive. And when it came to salsa dancing, they flat out did not approve. So I turned inward. What else could I do? There was no one to talk to. There was no one to provide guidance and there was no one interested. Fortunately, my passion was so strong that I pursued it despite the lack of support. But I always wonder how things would have turned out if I had a safe space to express myself. So here are three steps to creating a safe space for your kids to express themselves. One, get curious. When I would get excited about something and share it with my parents, I couldn't even tell if they were listening. They were often busy with something else and they rarely asked questions to keep me talking, so I didn't. Instead, I walked away dispirited. When your kids present their ideas, carve out some time for them. And if you can't in that moment, that's okay. Schedule it so that they can see that you're interested. And in that time that you have for them, be 100% present, get curious, ask questions until you see their eyes and their smiles widen. Step two, get excited. If not for their idea, at least for their excitement. You can ask all the right questions, but if your face is expressionless or your tone is monotonous, your kids will think your attention is out of obligation and not out of genuine interest. For us to want to share our ideas and our dreams, we want someone who will at least get excited at the fact that we are dreaming and can show that back to us in their smiles, their energy and their enthusiasm. And step three, mind your words. <laughs> After listening, asking questions and showing your excitement, there will come a moment where you are asked to or you will want to say something. You are, after all, the adult, the one with the most experience. And when you speak, you will speak from all of those years of experience, but know that just as your words will bring your knowledge and wisdom to the conversation, they will also indirectly and often unknowingly bring your fears and insecurities also. Kids absorb so much. They already have their own fears and insecurities. <laughs> and as parents and educators, let's try not to burden them with ours as well. So if you find your kids quiet and unenthused, it's not because they don't have things they're excited about. They just don't feel comfortable sharing them with you. And if you wanna change that and build a healthy relationship, revisit those three steps and see if there's something you could do differently to help them feel safe communicating with you. Lesson two, <laughs> prepare more than you protect. And when it comes to safe space, it's not about putting them in a padded room. It's protecting them from everything, making sure they never get hurt, never suffer and never struggle. Our attempts to shield our kids from all harm only serves to cripple their growth and it disarms them when they go out into the real world. Honestly, I'd say I was kind of lucky in that sense. Since my parents weren't that involved or interested, 
I went right out into the real world and learned from life itself. And I have to tell you, I had some very, very rough experiences. I don't wish them upon anyone else, but the lessons I learned from them are what forced my growth, my independence, and my resilience. When our focus is more on protection, we do everything. We are the shield that they can hide behind. And when we focus on preparation, however, we teach them how to identify threats, how to build their own shield, how to use it, when to use it, and when to put it away. And this is how we prepare them, by constantly creating opportunities for our kids to hold positions of responsibility, to communicate effectively, to negotiate, to be uncomfortable, to get creative, to struggle, to adapt, to accept consequences, and to be resilient in the face of failure so that they can succeed and thrive in life. And the final lesson for today is to always engage from a place of empathy and patience. Your children are yours, but they are not you. Even if they went through the exact same things you went through, there is no guarantee that their response or the outcome would be the same. And why would you even want it to be? Is yours the best possible? So try to be patient, to accept their pace of growth, understanding, application, and achievement. Nudge them, but don't force them. And when you don't see progress at a pace that you expect or that you desire, don't lean into frustration. Get curious instead. How could you present things differently? What are you missing or not understanding about your child? What might you yourself need to learn to be a better parent or educator. I think that we are all works in progress with potential for greatness within all of us. And the best way to cultivate that greatness and create strong, independent and inspiring leaders is by increasing our self-awareness and developing healthy and supportive networks. And the lessons I've shared today have been instrumental in my personal growth, my career and my relationships. And I hope you can all also find a way to apply them to your lives in ways that help you think, feel, and be more empowered. Thank you very much. <laughs> I see so many messages in the chat. I'm like trying to keep the, <laughs> the- That was amazing and perfect and beautiful. And I was like crying and Victoria's sitting here hugging me. Oh. So, I mean, so much resonates with me as a mom as a human being, a fellow human being. Um, so I have a few questions, but I think I'm gonna start with, um, do you think that your culture played a role in your feelings of not feeling heard or being seen? Because I feel like I grew up in a Greek home, but not a traditional Greek home. I have a lot of friends that grew up in Greek homes very different than mine. And I think there was um, language barriers, number one, uh, culture, you know, played a huge role where you go to school, you don't sit with the adults, you don't give your opinion on things and you're not feeling heard or seen pretty much your whole entire childhood. Um, do you think that played a role in, you know, your, you know, your culture played a role in, in all of that for you, you know, your feelings and whatnot? I would definitely say initially, I did feel that my, my parents, I, I came from India. And so the culture is also quite traditional in some ways. Right. It's one of the reasons why um, my parents didn't really accept dance. You know, how are you making a career in other men's arms? Like, what are you a prostitute? What the, you know, what are you doing? It was very frowned upon. And to this day, I mean, it's not viewed with like, my daughter travels the world and does all of these things. I'm like, no, she dances. And there, it's still not something, even after having a career in it for 20 years. And I do believe that it's a cultural thing because of the way Indian culture views intimacy, touch, um, and just a relationship between men and women. There's a certain uh, boundary at which people should not be crossed crossing unless they're actually married. So yeah, I do. I would say that. Yeah. 
Awesome. And I just have one more and then I'm going to open it up to the crowd. Sure. Um, what made you take the road less traveled? Do you think that was something innate? Do you think that's just part of who you are? Or do you think because you struggled, it kind of lit the fire in your soul and made you say like, here I am world, like I'm going to go do my thing. Um, what do you I'm, think happened? I'm not entirely sure if it was something that was always within me or that got nurtured through time. All I know is that I've always been a very curious child to the point of borderline being very annoying to my teachers. I, I remember in grade one uh, when they, we had dinosaurs, right? We were like coloring dinosaurs in class. And I told my dad, oh, you know, this is what we're doing. And he took me to the museum and we saw the dinosaur exhibit, which was very cool. And he would tell me, oh, this is a stegosaurus. It's a herbivore and herb means this and blah, blah, blah. And then I came back to school and we were coloring again. And I was like, oh, Mrs. So-and-so, this is a herbivore and herbivores only eat because of herbivores. And she's like, um, how about you just stay within the lines? You know? So I have always had that curiosity. I think it has helped me for sure in my career and in my life and in my relationships. I'm not entirely sure if I could say I would credit it to anyone. If anything, my dad uh, at a very young age would, would told me that anything the mind can conceive and believe it can achieve. So he did put that into me and instill that into me, but it wasn't necessarily a curiosity per se for things. Okay, great answers. Thank you. You're amazing. So <laughs> does anyone else have any questions? If there's, there's a little box on the bottom that says reactions and you can just, oh, here we go, Alexa. Alexa, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, Magna. How are Hi, you? Okay. Great. Thank you. So I have a question. I actually used to dance too. So I just want to ask like, what kept you going? Like, how did you like stay so passionate about it? Excellent question. Um, there are two approaches that I took to that. One approach was the, the creativity, the creative aspect of it. So there was a time that I got very, very good at the dancing. I was, became an excellent follower. And to me, I just felt like I plateaued. And I didn't like, I was almost losing interest in the dance. And it was in that moment that I shifted my focus from the dance itself, the technical aspects of it, and shifted it to people. And once I move, and, and that goes for all of us, once we shift our attention to the human element, there is no end to what you can learn and you really realize how little we actually know about people and how quickly they change. And so all of a sudden, even though I knew dance very, very well, I knew the technique to do spins and styling and all this stuff. When I brought my partner into it, I didn't know my partner as well as I thought. And even the partner that I had yesterday, if I dance with the same person, isn't the same person today. Maybe they ate something different and they don't feel all right. And all of a sudden the connection becomes different between us. And so I started to explore that. I became very curious about what is different. And when I looked for the differences, there was always an abundance of things to keep my attention and keep my interest. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is through the criticism that I had gotten, the people that were like, oh, you know, you're never gonna make it. Like, and as a female in a male dominated industry, as an Indian in a Latin industry, there was a lot of pushback and I would hear it. I would hear it on the side of the dance floor and it would be said in Spanish thinking I didn't understand it. Like, que esta haciendo es, esta chica no es, no es salsa. Like, what is she doing? That's not salsa. You know, and I heard that and I could have been offended by it, but I felt so good when I danced. And that connection with me and my partner felt so fulfilling and I could see the smile on their face. So who cares what you think? You know, that whole concept of you're not in the arena, you're just a spectator. So until you want to join me in the arena, I don't really have any patience for what you tell me I should be doing or that I should be exiting this. <laughs> Hope that answered Thank it. Thank you. You're welcome. Good. Any other questions from anyone? Oh, I there's oh yeah Natalie. so I think this this applies to high school girls specifically and of course it leads into um being an adult and being a woman 
you know, and having that thick skin and going back to one of your lessons of you can't please everyone. So when we had that conversation the other day, right? Um, so how do you really deal with that? I mean, I think it's about developing a thick skin, but what advice would you give to a high school girl who might be dealing with all the chatter in high school and the drama that goes on? And it seems so much more bigger when you're in high school, as opposed to when you're an adult, right? As adults, we can kind of we can look at it and we can understand, okay, this isn't really that dramatic. The, the world is not going to come to an end. Right. But in high school, it seems like the end of the world. So what would you recommend? What advice can you give? Um, this is where I say our networks are so important. Again, I don't feel like I can speak to my own because I didn't have that, unfortunately, or fortunately, because I feel very proud of where I've arrived today. And that is a direct result of my past experiences. But I think our networks are really important. And these are moments where if you have someone to share that with, especially an adult, it makes it so crucial because they will probably show you and tell you and share all of their experiences of when they were with the cool kids and when they got bullied and what they went through and show you where they are today and how much they've been able to conquer and how, how, how big it feels in that moment, but ultimately that you will also conquer it yourself. And so it, I think it really depends on our networks where people are supportive where they allow you to express your fears and not ridicule you for making it a big deal. That's a big part because sometimes, you know, someone says, oh, you know, I'm so scared of this and um, so-and-so is making fun of me and she called me this name and you're like, it's nothing, but it's something. You have to be able to stop and acknowledge it's nothing to you after 40 years, 50 years on this planet, but it's a huge deal to your child who's been there for just 16 years or in high school for just that one year, right? So the first step would be acknowledging whatever it is that they're saying and giving it the weight that they give it. And then slowly introducing them to the perspective or the reality to show them how to put those things into perspective. I needed okay. to hear that tonight, Magna. <laughs> um, you, you know, I'd like, to, I'd like to just comment on one other thing. Um, because we do have a lot of parents here. I don't think we realize how much of an impact we have. I know I mentioned it earlier about like, mind your words, right? And what we bring to the table in terms of fears and insecurities and how our, how our kids might suffer from that. But I, I feel like I've turned out awesome. Now I feel great about who I am today. But I will tell you that that childhood where I didn't have a chance to speak to anybody, where my parents, like anytime I brought something that I was excited about to my parents, they just kind of was like, eh, whatever, you know? Oh, you dance, mm, that's great, right? And then move on to something else has affected me today. You know, like I was thinking about this presentation. I'm so excited about it, right? I'm so uh, keen on sharing these lessons because I hope that I could inspire other people to, to achieve and to be ambitious to go for their goals and their passions. But I realized I only shared this with one person. I only shared this outline of this presentation before today, yesterday, last night with one friend. And I only went through some of the lessons that I had listed out. Why? Because I didn't think anybody would be interested. So today, I'm 40, you know, that was my childhood 30 years ago. It still impacts the way I, the, the confidence I have, the, the desire to express, the desire to share, and the constant, the little person in my, on my shoulder saying, why would you share this? What makes you think this is important? Nobody cares about the things that you're pursuing, you know? So it's really important for us as, as educators and as parents to, to nurture those dreams and nurture those passions. Well, Victoria, my, my middle daughter who's here, Maya and Dana who are on here as well, who I don't know, but I love already. They've all said how beautiful and important all of this was to hear. So you're doing amazing things. They say, if you can help one person in this lifetime, you've 
literally changed the world in some way. So you're doing that, Magna. So <laughs> bring yourself up here, right? As you're telling all of us to do. We're here, we're listening, and we're super, super interested. And, in, you know, we've acknowledged you. So thank you. I appreciate that. Thank and it's you. actually, it's actually funny because this goes into that first lesson that I said, you know, you, you kind of got to be okay with being alone. And right. fortunately I am, you know, so of course I'd love to share these goals and these, um, these dreams that I have and the outline that I spent hours and hours creating, but if there's no one to share it with, I can find the support myself. I can be that's my right. own cheerleader, you know, and that's what I, I think love we that. really need to, to find in ourselves on every level, you know, as teenagers um, and as Yes. You Zazu. A- oh, sorry. Zazu. We have like three questions. So okay, go, sure. but go ahead. Natalie, go ahead, honey. I just wanted to say, and you have us and that's, the, yes, that's right. The point of wonder girls. It's not that's just right. a, a network and a group for high school girls, but we bring yeah. professional diverse women into this wonderful right. mix of women, young women, and adult women so that we can guide and support each other and create this network. And I appreciate it. That's why I'm so on board with everything that you guys are doing. I think it's fantastic. And we have another wonder woman with us, Zazu. She has a cup of question. Sure. So. Yes. Thank you, Irene. Um, And thank you, Magna. I thoroughly Mm -hmm. relate to and um you know enjoyed everything that you shared and I think it's so helpful for not only sharing for the girls but also again like lessons for adults even you know the ones that were a little bit maybe more geared towards the girls but for all of us really um so my question and something that I feel like I is this is just like a thing I'm going to continue to work on for the rest of my life is boundaries. Um, And so I feel like most of us uh, just a lot of times, just the way society kind of um, influences, you know, us is like, we're here to help everyone. Um, And so my question to you is, how would you um, explain or um, how would you kind of tell like a young girl how to communicate her boundaries with the people around her, including, you know, her friends and her family? A uh, great question. I think the first part is before communicating the boundaries is identifying them. And in identifying them, being comfortable and accepting that your binder, your boundaries might not be the same as other people's. I think that's the other challenge that we have when it comes to expressing our boundaries. Let's say, for example, that we are very physical, right? I'm a very physical person. I hug, I touch, I'm like punch people in the arm. I'm that person. But if everyone says, oh, you shouldn't do those things, right? That's not how you respect yourself. All of a sudden, I'm not gonna wanna communicate my boundaries beyond that. I'm going to hesitate to communicate anything, right? So the first step would be in identifying what you are comfortable with, you know? And sometimes um, that happens through the things that you see and the things that you experience. But if we don't take the moment to reflect on ourselves, we'll never be able to come to that answer or be able to answer that question. Once we have our boundaries, once we can say, okay, you know what? I like this, but I don't really like this then it is a matter of, um, again, going back to like, you can't please everyone. You might offend somebody, right? Even kindly saying, hey, listen, you know, that's not really my thing if you don't mind. Uh, I, I, I would appreciate that you don't do that. They might be like, oh, that's so rude. I can't believe you would say that to me. I wasn't even trying to do anything. You might offend people, but you have to take that risk. And ultimately, what makes you comfortable? Because in this world, yes, we are helping other people, but we are, we are living it. But we don't set those boundaries, we suffer. And the other person is not the one who's suffering. We are gonna be suffering from it. So understand the impact of not communicating. You know, I think it's almost better sometimes to offend someone when you are trying to stand your ground than try not to offend them and then be damaged for who knows how long. I hope that helps or I hope that answers. 100%. No, I love that. And um, yeah, it's a great thing, I think, to 
to try to start to even think about. Like, I, I wish I would have been able to even think about that concept in that way at a younger age, because I feel like, you know, the more practice you have, the better you get at it Absolutely. And, and the then better you get at really safeguarding yourself and investing in yourself and making sure that you're okay. Right. And this goes, and then this goes into the lesson about um, for the educators and the parents, number two, prepare more than you protect, like create those opportunities for kids to, to test their boundaries, you know, force them out there to play with other kids, you know, and if the kids are all rowdy or really loud and they don't like that, then that's one of your boundaries. I don't like this kind of too many people. I don't want this many people around me. Now, you know this. How would you know that if you're always at home with just your family, right? You have to be placed in situations to, that's, that's how we learn. The best way to learn is through life itself. Um, and if we can do that safely, you know, create those environments where there's no real harm that would come and where we're always providing that support network um, for them, just in case, just in case the, the pain is too much. That's how we learn. 100%, thank you. My pleasure, thank you. There's, there's one more question from yep. Wade. And he says, we talk about relationships between parents and kids, but he feels responsible for, to support my cousins, more than 10 of them and my sister. How can I lift them up as their cousin and brother? Like, What advice do you have? Um, so that's a, a beautiful question. And in Wade's case, even though they're cousins um, and siblings, you're basically going to be taking on the role of the parent and the educator. You, know, you are the support network. So I would say one of the ways is to follow those three steps of creating a safe space. You know. Uh, get curious, ask them, what do they want to do? What are the things that inspire them? What do they dream about? Put those questions and, and get them to start talking. And as they talk, show your excitement for any of the things that they're excited about. And then through your own experience, see how you can help them, guide them along their way. And considering that you feel like they are your peers and that maybe you don't have um, this extensive experience and extensive years on this planet over them, then see if you can guide them to someone who does. You know, there is nothing wrong with asking for help. There is nothing wrong with delegating. You know, I think uh, a lot of us, and, and I'm very guilty of this, you know, is I want to get things done. I, I have a feeling or I know kind of how I want things done. And I'm, I'm hesitant to go out of that and ask somebody for help. And I'm hesitant to delegate because I'm not sure if they'll do, do it the way I want it done, you know, if they'll meet my expectations and my standards. But again, back to that experience of how are you gonna know if you don't give somebody a chance, right? And also that is your opportunity to learn because maybe you had an idea of what ideal is until someone completely broke that idea and then showed you a different way of doing things that you had no idea about before, and all of a sudden you realize, actually, this is even better, right? So Wade, that's, uh, that's one way I would start is best way to focus on them is to, to, to um, listen to them, acknowledge them, find out what they're interested in, see how you can nurture their growth. And if you yourself can't help them, see if you can find someone who can. I think acknowledge is like the word of the night. It's going to stay with in my mind, acknowledge, acknowledge, right? Ourselves, our own feelings, our kids, their feelings, everybody. Exactly. Yeah. You're amazing, Magna. Any other questions? We're just coming to the end of this amazing presentation, but if you guys have any other questions, you can always email us. True. Actually, they're your survey form, right? They have at the end. Yes. Yes. I'm going to actually put that in the, uh, in the chat for everybody. <clears throat> Natalie, uh, do we have anything? Yes, just wanted to thank you so much, Magna. That was amazing, incredible. It's exactly what we all needed to hear, both for our high school girls and our young girls who are on here, um, including my niece who just turned 10. She was so cute just texting me saying how good it was. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, wait, sorry to interrupt. We have one more question from Sophia. Yeah. Um, 
She said, how do you walk away from haters? <laughs> oh, um, I don't. <laughs> I don't walk away from them. I appreciate their presence, actually. This is another thing uh, with, with life in general, contrast is important to appreciate. If everything was good, if everyone was kind to you, if everyone was praising you, how good are you really? How would you even know? Right? It's when you feel that negativity that you can appreciate what positivity feels like. So I like my haters. I appreciate them being around. I having a social media presence, like what I was talking about, the critics, oh, they're very prominent. If you go on any of my social media channels, you go through the comments, you'll be like, oh, wow, did, did Magna read this? Yep, I did. I read them all. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't mind. I appreciate them. I appreciate their existence just the same way that I appreciate poor teachers, poor speakers, poor parents, everything, because it shows me what I don't want, what I don't want to be and how I can be better. So that's how I approach my haters. <laughs> I welcome them. <laughs> I think Alexa had one, her hand up if I saw. Oh, no, sorry, I was clapping. <laughs> oh, oh, that's a clap, my bad. It's a clap. Yeah. <laughs> <Right. laughs> well, everyone, thank you so much. It, it, it's, it's eight o'clock and I don't want to take up too much of your time. Magna, thank you so much. My well, pleasure. And really I would just like to say one other thing. Um, my contact info is up on the, the slide now. If you have any questions, you are more than welcome to reach out to me via email or send me a direct message on Facebook or Instagram. On my YouTube channel, I do a monthly live chat where I actually answer people's questions. So if you want to engage there or you want to submit a question in advance, you can do that as well. Um, there are tons of videos and content out there answering things and dealing with a lot of these issues. Um, but yeah, if you need any information, you're more than welcome to contact me. I become better by helping other people. And so when you reach out to me, you're providing me an opportunity to grow and, and be better as well. Absolutely. And just wanted to add that Magna is one of our featured speakers for our 12 week program after school program. So you'll definitely if any of our students are on here that will where the program will be at your high school starting in September, you'll see her again. And of course, we're also doing more events uh, throughout the year that will be open to the public. And I'm sure I can snag her back in to help us um, because she's so amazing. But yes, please contact her. And if you do have any other questions for us, for Wonder Girls, you can email us um, and go to our website at wondergirlsusa.org. And if you want to get involved in any way, there's a whole page um, on our website of uh, different ways that you can get involved, whether if you are a professional uh, woman that you'd like to be a part of our, as our mentors, as our speakers, um, but also being a volunteer, a volunteer. We also are looking for writers and people to help us with media and social media. So there's so many opportunities. Just take a look at our website and please keep in mind all of our events coming up. We'd love to have you more and please share if you enjoyed this, please, please share this with anyone you think would, that would benefit uh, from hearing our message. Oh, and I actually, just put the, um, I just put the survey in the chat box. So if everybody could just click on it, it literally takes two minutes. And if you could just fill it out now, like right when we get off, just click on it and it'll open in your, on your screen and you can fill it out when we're done. Or you can save the whole chat, um, the, three little, the three little dots next to file in the chat box. You can just click on that and push save chat and you can save all of this. And, so. and also for our social media people, I know not everyone's on social media, but some of us are always on social media, self-included. Um, you could maybe, Share one of the lessons that you found resonated most with you, put it on there, and then perhaps add a little comment about- What Victoria just said she wants to do. Oh, perfect. Yeah. How you it. Would, she said that. Yeah. How you would, so um, how you would attack that lesson, that how you could apply that lesson, or what steps you're going to take, and then tag us. Tag me, tag, tag Natalie, tag Irene, tag Wonder Girls, and then we'll share it yes. too. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so, so much for- 
not just being here to listen to this and sharing your comments and your thoughts and your questions, but also the opportunity that I got to reflect. And I would have not, I'm not sure when I would have gone through all my life and said, oh, here are some of the 10 most important lessons, but I did this because I was given this opportunity. So it's because of you that I've had a chance to see what my life has been like as well. So thank you so much. This was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. And we'll see you again very soon. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye, bye everybody. Thank you.